Good morning, Holt Church of the Nazarene. So I'm going to be reading the scripture that Pastor Deborah is going to be preaching from this morning. If you'll follow along with me, it's out of the book of Nehemiah. And it is. it starts in chapter 2, verses 11 through 18, then it skips to all of chapter 4, and then a couple of verses in chapter 6. So try to follow along if you can, but if not, just listen to me read, and I will go right to it. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, um, so if you're reading a different translation, it might not exactly line up, but here we go. So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well and over, over the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So though it was still dark, I went up to Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entering again at the valley gate. The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, You know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Now Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap? And charred ones at that. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, That stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Then I prayed, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads. And may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last the wall was completed to half of its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> but we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying... Before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families, armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeters stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people 
This work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to whoever is sounding. Then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late, from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. I, al I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Last week, Pastor Dana um, did a great job in sharing with us the first part of the story from Nehemiah. We heard how Hanani, a brother of Nehemiah, had come from Jerusalem and upon Nehemiah's inquiry shared how things were not good for the Jews in Jerusalem. They were in great trouble and disgrace, dis, disgrace because the wall of Jerusalem had been torn down and the gates burned. Nehemiah mourned and he fasted and he prayed. He first acknowledged the Lord, God of heaven and, and earth. You are worthy of our praise and complete respect. He, he shared that God was loyal and committed to his people. He kept his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. He asked the Lord to listen to his prayer as he prayed night and day for the people of Israel and confessed their sins in not obeying his commands and decrees and regulations. And he reminds God of his promises to his people. If they return to him and obey his commands and live with them, he would bring them back to a place of honor of his name, to the temple where his presence dwelt. Pastor Dana did an excellent job of showing us the need to respond to difficulties by, first of all, going to prayer, second of all, sharing our prayers, um, in, our, in our prayers, praise and confession, as well as our needs, while remaining humble and believing that God wants to answer our prayers. It was in the fall of the year when Hanani shared the condition of Jerusalem with Nehemiah. In the following spring is where we pick up our story today. Nehemiah is still greatly troubled by the news that the providence of Judah is in great trouble and distress. The walls were in despair and the gates were burned. The walls were what protected the city from bandits and gangs and wild animals and other governors coming in and taking over. To leave the temple of the Lord unproductive was disgraceful and it put them in danger of great trouble. Nehemiah served as a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, and the king noticed that Nehemiah was very sad, so he inquired as to why Nehemiah was so sad, and then Nehemiah shared his concern for the city of his ancestors, and when the king asked him how could he help, Nehemiah first prayed and then asked the king to send him to Judah to rebuild the city. He also asked the king for letters addressed to the governor showing his support and asking for safety and supplies for the rebuilding. Nehemiah makes the five-month journey from Susa to Judah. After three days, uh, um, when he's in Judah, after three days, he heads out at night, taking along with him a few others to inspect the condition of the wall. Now, he hadn't told the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone in the administration about why he had come to the city, probably because he didn't want to share with them his plan too early and get negative momentum going. He wanted to inspect the situation. He wanted to have first-hand knowledge of the work that needed to be done. After seeing the condition of the wall, he then goes on to the administration, the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, and the officials, and he says to them, listen, you know very well the trouble we are in. You are aware of the disgraceful condition of the wall. Jerusalem, it lies in ruins, and the gates have been burned with fire. Let's rebuild the walls and end our disgrace. The Jewish culture places significant value on being honored. So saying the condition of the wall was in disgrace to them would have evoked a sense of disrespect rather than honor. 
The mission God placed on Nehemiah's heart was to rebuild the wall and end the Jewish disgrace. Nehemiah's intent in his public address probably was to get their attention and arouse a desire within them to get to work. It was going to take a lot of work, a lot of manpower. But when Nehemiah shared how God's hand had been upon him and his conversation that he had had with the king and, and how the king had brought support, they said, yes, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they got to work. Of course, the local governors, Sanabalat, Tobiah, and Gershom, scoffed at the plan. It posed a threat to their livelihood. These men had joined together along with the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod to fight against Jerusalem. And they mocked the Jewish people. They mocked them and they questioned their ability to do the work necessary to rebuild the wall. Their goal was to discourage them from doing the work necessary to complete the vision. Nehemiah was faced with people coming to him in complaint. They feared that the enemy would come from all directions and attack. They complained that the workers were getting tired. It was too much work. Their confidence that they could do the work, it began to wane. So Nehemiah answered their fears and complaints with a plan. He called the people to prayer for God's continued protection. He placed armed guards behind the lowest part of the wall in the exposed area. He stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords and spears. He reminded them that they didn't need to be afraid of the enemy. Instead, they should remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for their brothers, their sons, their daughters, and their wives and their homes. From that point on, they worked with half of them on guarding and half doing the work. And the people who were building the wall carried their work with one hand, carried on their work with one hand, supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. They worked early and late from sunrise to sunset. The work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem was so important and dangerous that it required a high commitment, prayer, and effort. It took only 52 days to rebuild the wall and complete the task laid on the heart of Nehemiah by God. Within each of us is a God-given purpose, something we are to accomplish, work we are to do. In Genesis 2-2, we read, by the seventh day, God had finished his work, the work that he had done. Because we're made in the image of God, if God works, we too will be most fulfilled if we work. In Genesis 2-2, we read, by the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And in Genesis 2-15, we read, God put Adam and Eve in the garden to take care of it. When God created the world, he included work that needed to be done. Adam and Eve had purpose. They had mission to take care of the garden where God had placed them. When we sin and sin entered the world, the mission, the work, it changed. Jesus told his disciples in John 6, 29, this is the work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. In 1 John 3, 23, this idea is repeated. We must believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Nehemiah was given the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And as I already said, it was so important that it required high commitment, prayer, and effort. God still calls us to build up his kingdom. Our work is to believe in Jesus Christ and build up his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We build up his kingdom by loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus said in John 13, 34, that the way we show love that we love God is to love one another. This is our work, to love God and to love one another. But sometimes this work can require more time and energy than we feel we have. But we're told to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 58. And I would suggest that you take some time this week to actually look those verses up. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 58. But let me read for you what verse 58 says. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. In, Corinth, in Colossians 3.23, we are informed that whatever we do, we should do it all 
with all of our hearts as of working for the Lord, not for man. So whether it's laundry or dishes or shoveling snow, whatever it is, we are to do it as if we were doing it for the Lord. And it gives a different perspective to what we're doing. I want you to hear this this morning. The work of the Lord isn't something we do for God. It is something God does through us for others. He does it as we give ourselves fully to him. I shared a story from my past this week with a group that I meet with. When my children were small, God had impressed upon my heart to put together an encouragement box for someone that I had just met that week, a woman. I didn't know this woman, and I had small kids at home. I had a lot of things. I had a laundry list of things that I needed to do at home. We didn't have extra money to buy things to put into that encouragement basket. And I didn't even know what I should take to encourage this woman. But I knew that I had heard from the Lord that this is what I was supposed to do. I took an old basket from our basement that somebody had given us fruit in the previous Christmas. And I took it upstairs and cleaned it up. I found a coffee cup in my cupboard that somebody had given me with a verse on it. So I put that in the basket. I had some tea packets that I put in there. And I put in there a brand new package of ground coffee that I had just bought at the store. That was a sacrifice, I might say. And then on top of that, we made poppy seed muffins to put in the basket. We always had the ingredients for poppy seed muffins because they were one of our favorite things to eat. Well, I made the muffins, I fixed the basket, I put a little card in there saying, I hope this is an encouragement to you. I loaded my kids in the car and I headed out for the address that I had for her. It wasn't something that I really had time for. It wasn't something that I really wanted to do, but I knew that it was what God wanted me to do. A simple task, yet work. I found out that the woman needed encouragement. She needed someone to care about her. She needed to know that God cared about her and that he answered her prayer, that he was listening to her, that someone noticed her. I didn't want to take the time to do what I felt God was asking me to do, but I had given myself fully to the Lord. And when I couldn't shake the idea that I needed to do it, I did what I was supposed to do. And God did his work through my act of obedience. Nehemiah had given himself fully to God's mission, his work. The task was huge, but the motivation was greater. Completing the work would show that God loved his people. When confronted with a large task, we need to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Christians especially have motivation to tackle the big tasks of life. Listen to what atheist Roy Hattersley says as Dana reads a story he wrote. It ought to be possible to live a Christian life without being a Christian, laments Roy Hattersley, a columnist for the UK Guardian. An outspoken atheist, Hattersley came to this conclusion after watching the Salvation Army lead several other faith-based organizations in relief efforts for Hurricane Katrina. Notably by their absence, notable by their absence, he says, were teams from the rationalist societies free thinkers clubs, and atheist associations, the sort of people who scoff at religion's intellectual absurdity. According to Hattersley, it is an unavoidable conclusion that Christians are the people most likely to take the risks and make the sacrifices involved in helping others. Hattersley also notes that this pattern of behavior goes beyond disaster relief. Civilized people do not believe that drug addiction and male prostitution offend against divine ordinance, but those who, are the, who do are the men and women most willing to change the fetid bandages, replace the sodden sleeping bags, and probably most difficult of all, argue without a trace of impatience that the time has come for some serious medical treatment. The only possible conclusion, says Hattersley, is that faith comes with a pocket of moral imperatives that while they do not condition the attitude of all believers, influence enough of them to make Christians morally superior to atheists like me. I believe it is because love. Love is behind everything God does and everything he moves upon the hearts of his sons and daughters to speak and do in his name. 
In John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. Dan Moeller says, Love is a surrendered life for the sake of another. I'm going to say that again. Love is a surrendered life for the sake of another. If God's love has been poured into our hearts, our mouths should speak of that love, meaning that what comes out of our mouths is evident of what is truly in our hearts. This is the essence of Matthew 22, 27, and 30. We are to love God and put him first and love others. That means do no harm to others. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the large task. We see all the problems rather than the solutions. Don't let the problems seem bigger than the solutions. God's got a plan. He can use you to accomplish his plan. When Nehemiah saw the walls of Jerusalem in ruins, he immediately set about to fix them. He got right to work. He shared with the Israelites what they already knew, and he appealed to their values. He must have been good at casting vision as well, because the leaders of Jerusalem pitched in right away. When given a task, we may react differently to the task based on our personalities, and that's okay. But in the end, we all need to get to work. What is our work? Our work is to love God and to love one another, to worship God by loving his creation and to share his kingdom living principles with others so they worship God and love his creation. Micah 6, 8 tells us what God requires of us, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And like Nehemiah, we should expect opposition so we are not surprised by it. We learn from our story that opposition comes in the form of ridicule. Ridicule gets us to doubt our call, our purpose, our mission, and the work at hand. And the solution to that is to pray, to take criticism to the Lord in prayer and get God's perspective and leave it in his hands to sort out. I'm going to say that again. When we are under opposition, we need to take the criticism to the Lord in prayer and to ask God for his perspective in the situation and then leave it in his hands to sort out. Nehemiah had a twofold action plan when it comes to opposition to counter the threats. First, he prayed, and in addition, he posted guards. Scripture informs us in Proverbs 4.23 that we are to guard our hearts above all else, for it determines the course of our life. One way to guard our hearts is to remember that we are a child of God in relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. In 1 John 2.6, we read that the one who says he resides in God ought himself to walk just as Jesus walked. It only takes a brief reading of the New Testament to see how Jesus walked. He was someone who walked with compassion, empathy, and love for, towards others. I want you to hear this morning, this church, we are not in this alone. We are the family of God called to do the work of God for the glory of God. We're a family. And when it work becomes overwhelming, when it became overwhelming to the Israelites, when they became tired, Nehemiah stationed people in family groups. And then he reminded them not to be afraid, to remember the mighty and awesome Lord, and to fight for their families, their children, their brothers, their sisters, their wives. We have one another. We are here to encourage one another. That's the one of the purposes of the church, to build one another up, to encourage one another, to love on one another, to share one another's burdens. I'd also encourage you this week to take some time to just search in the word what it says about encouraging one another. We also see from the story of Nehemiah that actions speak louder than words. Nehemiah, Nehemiah led the Israelites to get to work. He encouraged them, he taught them to pray, and when opposition came, he provided a plan, and they were diligent to complete the task. Their diligence and God's faithfulness allowed them to complete the task in record time, a testimony to surrounding nations that God was with them. God is with us too. 
A year ago, God put the thought of a giving pantry in the hearts of our pastoral team. We shared it with you. When COVID hit, Katie shared the idea of a little pantry. Danny got to work building it. We dedicated it and people provided supplies for it. It was a small start to a dream put in our hearts to love those in our community. It was supposed, I was surprised when on Monday I found it empty after just filling it completely Sunday. The same thing happened Tuesday after filling it Monday. The enemy wanted to get us discouraged and someone actually asked me, well, what would you expect? To which I replied, I didn't expect greed, but need to be met. Like Nehemiah, we may have people whose only goal is to discourage us from doing the work necessary to complete the vision, but we are to roll up our sleeves and continue to do the work. We've had to tweak how we stop the giving, how we stock the giving pantry, especially with colder weather. There are certain things that we can't put in the pantry because it might freeze. But with prayer and diligence and hard work, we are serving a community. Um, we are serving our community in a need that they have, and it's for His glory. This past week, we set up the pantry inside and we stocked its shelves. And Kim Shepherd has agreed to serve two days a week in two different times, along with other people, to, to meet the needs of the people. She has agreed to be the point person for requests that are emailed in. In addition to that, she was able to, um, to get a donation from B2 um, this past week that they donated for the pantry and many other friends from around the whole community, as well as you from our congregation have donated items to stock the pantry. Like Nehemiah, who said, yes, we have people who have said yes to helping with this ministry. We have had three agree to help Kim during this time the pantry is open, but we need more. So if you're interested in helping and giving in your time and finances or supplies, contact me through a direct message. I can't wait to see what God does through us for others as we love one another. And there's more to come. So keep listening to the messages. Keep watching our special messages to see how we are going to impact our community this year for God's glory. What is God laying on your heart to do for the advance, advancement of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. For the opportunity we have, Lord, to be your hands and feet. For the work that you have to do. It is you that does the work, Lord, through our willingness to fully surrender to you. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue in 2021, no matter what comes at us, that we would remember that the now what is to be fully surrendered to you, to go to you in prayer, and to trust you with all that we do. Lord, be with our people today. Be with them this week. May you bless them as they go out into the world and serve you. In Jesus' name, we ask all of this. And all the people said, amen. If you um, are interested in being a part of the share and care um, time that we get to gather on Zoom right after this, if you would just um, post in the comments that you want to be a part of that, and um, we, will, we will send you an email or a text letting you know. And may we be glad to see you there, and God bless you.